Hello, everyone, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. I hope you enjoy listening to books. Today, the book I'm going to talk about is Minds Make Societies, subtitled, How Cognition Explains the World Humans Create. To be frank, the original title is rather understated. Considering the content, this book could perhaps be titled Subverting Your Understanding of Human Nature, or Understanding Humanity by Not Seeing People as People, or even in a more sensational style as Shocking. The Dual Standards Within Every Human Being Why do I say this? It all starts with the author of this book, Pascal Boyer. He currently holds the position of a professor in Social Cultural Anthropology and Psychology at the University of Washington, USA. He's a cross-disciplinary scientist, being both an evolutionary psychologist and an anthropologist. Boyer's primary focus lies in evolutionary psychology and the formation and development of human cognition. He's considered a prominent figure in evolutionary psychology and was elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. Up to this point, Boyer's academic works have been cited over 20,000 times, a figure comparable to another internet-famous psychology professor, Jordan Peterson. Simply perusing the table of contents, Minds Make Societies, appears to be an encyclopedia on human consciousness and decision-making. It covers a wide array of topics, cooperation among individuals, conflicts between groups, the origins of marriage and family, the long-standing existence of religion, and numerous other complex issues. To comprehend this extensive and intricate work, one must have a key, a central set of knowledge points, or a methodology. In my opinion, the most memorable point from Boyer's book is the admonition not to view people as a unified whole, in the book's terms, it's called refraining from personifying people. You might be perplexed by this idea. Not seeing people as a unified whole, how then should we perceive them? Should we break people down into scattered organs and view them that way? Feeling awkward about this notion is natural, after all, we've long been accustomed to regarding people as unified and indivisible entities. For instance, when we see someone pick up a cup of tea, we assume that person must enjoy tea or has a purpose in making that tea drinking gesture. Throughout this reasoning, we consistently perceive them as a whole. However, from a different perspective, the reason this person drinks tea could be due to their mouth and throat sensing insufficient moisture, their kidneys signaling an inability to filter blood properly to produce urine, thus prompting their brain to send nerve signals to their arms and fingers, pick up that cup of tea and drink. For Boyer, this approach of breaking the whole into parts is what gets us closer to the underlying logic and truth behind human behavior and decision making. Why? Because if you perceive people as a unified whole, if you believe that people evaluate all information and thoughts, then form explicit behavioral motivations, and finally consciously and intentionally act, you cannot explain many peculiar human psychologies and behaviors. Minds Make Societies presents a brand new perspective, viewing people as a complex system, a system that can be deconstructed into numerous independently operating modules. Each module serves specific functions, responsible for acquiring specific information from the environment and making intuitive inferences. You must meticulously scrutinize each module, understanding what each does and how it impacts the overall functioning of the complex system. Next, I'll break down the book into three sections to roughly explain its main content for you. To ensure a clear logical narrative, I've deliberately chosen a unique perspective, namely, starting from the individual, then the family, moving on to small groups, and finally, examining the larger market, to interpret Boyer's analysis of the underlying logic of human thinking, decision-making, and the evolutionary process. Part 1, let's start by discussing the individual. Considering people as a unified entity and describing their behavior with beliefs and intentions is referred to as the intentional stance. Conversely, Breaking people down into various modules to study which modules influence behavior and how these modules cooperate and interact constitutes the design stance. Boyer emphasizes that for a profound understanding of human nature and the origins of human thinking and decision-making preferences, it's necessary to shift from the intentional stance to the design stance. Why? Because humans are products of evolution. Our preferences, abilities, and sensory systems that determine which signals we receive are fundamentally designed by natural selection. For instance, why are dogs red-green colorblind while humans can distinguish red and green? 
In a 2017 publication in the Royal Society Journal, scientists proposed that this is due to evolutionary reasons. Dogs predominantly consumed meat and leftovers provided by humans, whereas humans needed to identify ripe, red fruits. Hence, the ability to perceive red was more important for humans and less so for dogs. Evolution has a characteristic, it's not a top-down unified plan but more like feeling one's way across a river, keeping every stone found along the way without discarding any, accumulating a pile of stones in a bag over time. Each stone has its own purpose, potentially conflicting with other stones. Similarly, humans are like products assembled from various stones. Examining the human genome reveals not a clean, elegant code but genes from various sources patched together. For example, the human genome even contains modules left by ancient retroviruses known as human endogenous retroviruses, HERV, occupying 1% to 8% of the human genome. Even useless viral remnants persist, let alone other functional modules. If this seems challenging to grasp, let's use a different analogy, likening humans to an automated car. Imagine an automated car smoothly overtaking another vehicle, making a right turn without accidents along the way. If you interpret this process as the car liking to overtake or turn right, disliking collisions, you're applying the intentional stance, personifying the car, yet still not understanding its operation. How can one think using the design stance? You need to disassemble the car and meticulously analyze each component. You'll discover the car operates through multiple independent environmental perception systems. For instance, the navigation system determines the car's location on Earth, cameras act as eyes, identifying traffic lights, signs, lane markings, weather, and nearby pedestrians and vehicles, laser radar generates precise 3D maps of the surroundings, millimeter wave radar detects blind spots and nearby obstacles, ultrasonic radar assists in reversing and parking. Each perception system independently gathers clues from the environment, analyzes signals, and reports findings. These reports, after algorithmic processing, influence the car's underlying execution systems, power, brakes, steering, and prompt action. All of this happens in an instant. When you see an automated car making a right turn, it's not because the car likes turning right or even because its central processor decides to turn right, but rather a collective action of many independent systems. By using the design stance, have you gained deeper insights into the underlying logic and operation of this car? In essence, humans are quite similar to automated cars. Primarily, humans come equipped with algorithms. Numerous studies have shown that even newborns aren't blank slates but arrive with evolutionary preset factory settings. For example, infants naturally prioritize human voices over other sounds to quickly learn their mother tongue. Moreover, beneath our skin, several independently operating modules exist. While most of these modules cooperate reasonably well due to hundreds of thousands of years of adaptation, they fundamentally act independently, resulting in occasional conflicts. Speaking of conflicting modules, the book discusses an intriguing experiment involving sugar water jars. Scientists at the University of Pennsylvania presented a group of individuals with two glass jars, sugar powder, a water container, two label papers, one marked sugar, and the other cyanide. Poisonous. The scientists assured that both jars were clean, the sugar was absolutely safe, the water was drinkable, and the labels were new without any contact with cyanide. Participants poured sugar and water into the jars themselves and randomly labeled one as sugar and the other as cyanide. Now, if you needed to pour some sugar water to drink, which jar would you pour from? Most people believe that even the jar labeled cyanide contained absolutely safe sugar water. However, when it came to drinking, most opted for the jar labeled sugar. Using the intentional stance to think of people as a unified whole makes it challenging to understand such contradictions. How can a person both disbelieve that a randomly labeled jar can turn sugar water poisonous yet still believe a random label can make sugar water toxic? However, employing the design stance helps to comprehend this contradiction. As mentioned earlier, humans comprise numerous independently operating modules, one being a vital module for detecting danger. Consider that detecting danger module as highly beneficial throughout human evolution. Our ancestors faced perilous environments, full of predators, 
poisonous snakes, treacherous terrains, toxic foods, requiring a highly developed danger-detecting module for survival and procreation, that is, for us to exist. Returning to the sugar water experiment, most of your body's modules would likely perceive no significant difference between the two jars. Yet, the moment you see the label, cyanide, poisonous, the danger-detecting module would sound a severe alarm, note, this module doesn't bother with logical reasoning, it's purely a reflex, suspected threat, trigger alarm. Consequently, your brain signals caution, triggering a defensive mode, leading you to refuse to pour water from the jar labeled cyanide. It's essential to remember that each module has its own activation triggers and specific types of information it focuses on. If information doesn't align with the module, that information cannot alter the conclusions drawn by that specific module. Similarly, with automated cars, ultrasound signals only affect ultrasonic radar, not millimeter wave radar. Why? Because frequencies don't match, ultrasound signals operate in tens of thousands of hertz, while millimeter wave signals operate in hundreds of billions of hertz. Hence, ultrasound and millimeter wave radars only receive signals matching their frequencies and don't analyze signals of other frequencies. Human modules work in a similar fashion. In the sugar water jar study, even if logically, you know, this is just a game, the scientists have no reason to harm me, or, I randomly labeled the jars myself, this information doesn't align with the activation conditions of the danger detecting module. Thus, this information can, at most, enter the modules for rational thinking and logical deduction but cannot reach the danger detecting module to alter its conclusions. Part 2 Here we go. Once we start considering the relationship between men and women from a design standpoint, a whole new world of understanding unfolds. Take young males' reckless or seemingly self-destructive behaviors as an example. Young men in the Pacific Island group of Melanesia engage in a game resembling a primitive form of bungee jumping. They climb a 24-meter high tower, tether their ankles with vines, and leap off. If you were to approach this behavior from an intent-based perspective, understanding why these men, who seemingly live normal lives, would undertake such a high-risk activity might be perplexing. However, shifting to a design standpoint offers some clarity. These men aren't experiencing a lapse in their danger detection module, instead, they're displaying oneself in front of the opposite sex module is overly active. This behavior has been coined as peacocking, a term that vividly captures the similarity between the peacock's elongated tail and the adventurous pursuits of human males. Though not advantageous for the survival as much as possible, natural selection, these behaviors effectively attract attention and highlight bravery, hence facilitating sexual selection. Let's talk about marriage for another example. We are so accustomed to the institution of marriage that we often take it for granted. Most human societies practice a monogamous spousal arrangement between one man and one woman, characterized by three main features, first, sexual exclusivity, implying that both parties ideally engage solely with each other, second, significant joint investment in offspring, where human fathers usually provide long-term resources and assistance rather than leaving child-rearing solely to the mother, finally, this spousal arrangement is typically long-term, even lifelong. There's no usual time frame attached, instead, the default assumption is an ongoing, unconditional cooperation and resource sharing between partners. We don't usually sign time-limited marriages, we don't say, let's get married for five years, but rather, our wedding vows often include the phrase, till death do us part. From an evolutionary perspective, marriage indeed exhibits peculiarities. Firstly, it's not a common phenomenon across the animal kingdom. Primates, close relatives of humans, don't adhere to monogamous spousal arrangements. Gorillas often have one male mating with multiple females, while chimpanzees and bonobos follow a promiscuous mating pattern. They don't form what we call marriage, and male primates don't contribute significantly to child-rearing, it's mostly left to the mothers. In nature, it's mostly certain bird species that form long-term couples and jointly nurture offspring, but birds and humans are vastly distant in terms of genetic relation. Secondly, there's an odd dichotomy regarding marriage, some individuals critique it while willingly entering into it. Some people perceive the demand for sexual exclusivity in marriage as a restraint, something against human nature. But simultaneously, marriage is prevalent in human societies, 
implying that in some sense, it must be aligned with human nature. Thinking from an intent-based viewpoint, it's challenging to comprehend why people would both detest and yearn for marriage, considering it both against and in alignment with human nature. However, from a design standpoint, understanding two modules is sufficient. The first module is the quest for sexual opportunities, while the second is the protect spouse, ensure survival of biological offspring module. Both these modules operate within the human body and constitute human nature, but they often conflict. One part of human nature desires sexual encounters with multiple partners, which goes against the idea of marriage. But another part aims to ensure maximum survival chances for one's biological offspring, which aligns with the institution of marriage. Thus, according to the author of Minds Make Societies, the primary driving force for human males in relationships is no longer just the pursuit of sexual opportunities, but rather the guarding of spouses to prevent infidelity. Why is this so? Let's delve into human evolutionary history. Over the past two million years, a significant change occurred in human evolution, human infants became weaker, making it difficult for mothers to raise them independently. The reason for weakened human infants is the strength gained by humans later in life. In terms of biological terms, humans evolved into a species that matures slowly. Humans are premature at birth, exceptionally fragile and unable to survive independently, relying on high-quality parental investment and an extended developmental period. But as humans mature, they grow massive, complex brains, learn extensively from the environment, innovate, engage in complex cooperation with others, hunt much stronger animals, and even alter the world. However, no matter how powerful they become later, if they succumb early on, it's all for naught. Therefore, the development of a monogamous spousal arrangement in humans offered significant evolutionary advantages. If a man and a woman could closely collaborate, establish a complex relationship encompassing sexual intimacy, resource sharing, and child rearing, in hunting and gathering eras where the man promised long-term provision of food and the woman ensured proper child rearing, then both parties ensured the survival of their offspring. That's how marriage came into existence. Therefore, the various idiosyncrasies of marriage, when viewed through the lens of evolution, become understandable. Why are human fathers so invested in their offspring? Why does becoming a father alter a man's neural circuitry and hormone levels? Because human infants require substantial investment from both parents. Why do humans like to hold grand wedding ceremonies? Because these elaborate rituals can signal to as many external parties as possible that these two individuals are entering a long-term agreement. After incurring such costs, it becomes much harder for either party to renege, evade their responsibilities, or obligations. However, this, protect spouse, ensure survival of biological offspring module also leads to certain darker aspects within relationships. For instance, intimate partner violence. As mentioned earlier, human fathers invest heavily in their offspring, providing them with food, engaging in play, teaching them skills, and protecting them in critical situations. If a considerable investment is made and the child isn't biologically related, the loss would be devastating. Therefore, the internal dynamics of various drives and evolutionary conflict have resulted in human males, guarding spouse, module becoming highly active. The purpose of this module is to monitor a partner to prevent contact with other males. In pursuit of this, males might undermine or attack rivals, seek ways to hide or even confine their partners. In extreme cases, this can escalate to violent control over their partners. Because humans haven't evolved a mechanism for paternity testing, this guarding spouse module inherently monitors proxy indicators such as the male's perceived worthiness as a mate, the female's attractiveness, or the local mating market's conditions. The lower the male's perceived value as a partner, the higher the female's attractiveness, and the more unequal the local economy, making winner-takes-all situations more likely, the stronger the need for this guarding spouse behavior in males. The concept of proxy indicators is worth explaining. Boyer suggests that human modules often automatically monitor observable clues, referred to as proxy indicators. Why? Because we cannot directly observe our gene's future share in the gene pool, i.e., we can't directly observe our evolutionary fitness. Hence, we resort to finding observable, closely related proxy indicators to monitor. 
George Box, a British statistician, famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This applies aptly to our modules as well. Strictly speaking, the proxy indicators monitored by these modules are all incorrect, but some of these indicators are useful. For instance, humans have a module for preventing inbreeding, focusing on the proxy indicator of who I cohabited with during childhood. The longer the cohabitation during childhood, the stronger the module perceives the kinship relationship, leading to a willingness to collaborate unconditionally but a decrease in perceived sexual attraction. Hence, Boyer believes that historically, marriages involving childhood cohabitation are more prone to breaking apart. In these marriages, the bride and groom grew up together, and even though they're not biologically related, the preventing inbreeding module subconsciously considers the other person as a sibling. Consequently, they fail to perceive sexual attraction to each other, even if they force themselves into marriage, it feels extremely awkward. Part 3 After discussing the intimate world of marriage, let's broaden the scope to a larger group. Pay attention because what follows is quite crucial, it's like a key to deeply understanding human nature. That key is the Alliance Detection Module. So, what's this Alliance Detection Module all about? It automatically focuses on information related to alliances, who belongs to which alliance around me? How many people are in each alliance? In a conflict between my alliance and others, which side is more likely to win? Do individuals within my alliance stick together and support each other? Are others loyal to my alliance? And so forth. Why did the Alliance Detection Module evolve? It's rather simple, actually. Human evolution was a response to environmental pressures, and guess what, other people constitute an environment, a highly significant and stressful one for us humans. There's a famous quote by Sartre that goes, hell is other people. In a certain sense, it implies that the environment formed by others is both harsh and treacherous. If you can't adapt to this other people, environment, evolution might just weed you out. But if you manage to adapt well to this other people, environment, collaborating closely and working together, you could achieve tremendous success. We all know humans excel at forming alliances and acting collectively. In fact, alliances can be considered the primary reason humans manage to sit atop the Earth's food chain. In terms of individual physical capabilities, humans are far inferior to various beasts when it comes to solo combat. We've grown so accustomed to alliances that it seems like an instinctual behavior. However, Minds Make Societies introduces a critical point, the more natural an instinct appears, the more it's worth dissecting and studying. It's crucial to perceive the peculiarities in familiar things and not take the intricate designs of evolution for granted. To form an alliance, all participants require at least six complex psychological mechanisms. One dot a clear, collectively beneficial goal that's hard to achieve individually but more feasible through teamwork. 2. Expectations that others in the alliance share similar views on this goal, encouraging cooperation. 3. Willingness to endure some personal losses for the collective goal, anticipating greater future gains through alliance cooperation. 4. Considering benefits to an opposing alliance as personal losses and vice versa, igniting motivation to confront opposing alliances. 5. Preparing for others to underestimate your contributions and sacrifices. 6. Anticipating that others within the alliance are making similar calculations. Break these down, and you'll find that forming an alliance and seeking personal gain within it is quite challenging. However, your alliance detection module in the brain has evolved to effortlessly and subconsciously perform these computations. For instance, just by observing a group conversing, your brain automatically discerns allies from non-allies, etching this information deeply into memory. While you might forget specific details of conversations, you'll remember who supported whom and who opposed whom, forming sides. Understanding the Alliance Detection module not only helps comprehend human greatness but also reveals the darkness and cruelty within humanity. Firstly, alliances often involve competition. Your alliance frequently confronts others. You might wonder why everyone can't win together, why not collaborate more for mutual gain? In modern market economies, expanding the pie is excellent, but during human mental evolution, economies weren't as prosperous, and positive-sum games weren't prevalent. 
Throughout human evolution, alliances primarily competed for something called social support. Social support is essentially a zero-sum game, the more support I receive, the less others get. The more supporters I have, the larger my alliance, the likelier it is to triumph in conflicts and grab resources. Secondly, the competitive nature of alliances might lead to racial discrimination, mutual hostility between groups, or even ethnic extermination. Let's start with racial discrimination. On one hand, humans are highly attentive to race. Numerous social psychology studies reveal that regardless of whether the task at hand relates to race, our brains automatically allocate cognitive resources to remember people's races we encounter. However, from an evolutionary perspective, there's no reason for us to have evolved such an attention to race. Encounters between people of different skin colors have only been happening for a few hundred years. For most of human evolution, people lived among those of the same race, with highly similar appearances. There was no need to evolve a specialized module to identify racial information. So, why the emphasis on race? Boyer suggests that our alliance detection module automatically collects clues from the environment, analyzing which alliance others belong to. These clues include appearance, accent, attire, decorations, religious items, habitual behaviors, and more. When people of different races meet, their distinct appearances, accents, habits get captured by the alliance detection module. Subconsciously, individuals perceive those from different races as part of a different alliance, anticipating conflicts of interest and competition for resources. Different people, different thoughts, it's akin to that. Reiterating, the division into groups is for resource competition. Fundamentally, discrimination and stereotypes exist to provide a legitimate reason for seizing resources, because your group is incapable, our group has the right to suppress you and take your resources. When people perceive a competing relationship between different groups, negative impressions develop because they intuitively feel that suppressing members of the other group benefits themselves. Competition for resources among different alliances is the real origin of discrimination and hostility. In the United States, for instance, research shows more discrimination against black men compared to black women. Black men's facial features are more likely to invoke perceptions of incompetence and violence, triggering automatic rejection and fear. They are often required to pay higher insurance premiums and deposits compared to black women. Why this greater discrimination against men? The alliance hypothesis offers a simple explanation. From an alliance perspective, men pose a greater threat to another alliance's superior position because they are stronger and more likely to compete for resources or seek retaliation. The alliance hypothesis can also explain an odd phenomenon, even when different groups cohabitate peacefully for generations, suddenly they become mortal enemies, displaying extreme hostility and violence towards each other. Previous explanations assume that there was always resentment, suspicion, and dissatisfaction between these groups. Eventually, a spark ignites accumulated hatred, leading to a collective explosion. However, according to the alliance hypothesis, we must differentiate between ethnic categories and alliances. People belong to ethnic categories, but not all ethnic categories evolve into alliances. Ethnic categories denote identity distinctions based on objective characteristics like lineage, appearance, language, tradition, and subjective standards like Jewish, Native American, Irish descent, etc. Alliances, on the other hand, gather individuals for collective goals and benefits. They are not an inherent reality but a process, an individual's cognitive transformation and a group's formation. People start viewing everything from the perspective of the alliance, considering the gains and losses of the alliance as personal gains and losses. When enough people adopt this perspective and act, a group with strong internal cohesion and external resistance forms. Let's analyze two tragic events, the Yugoslav Wars and the Rwandan Genocide. Prior to extreme violence, both Serbs and Croats, Hutus and Tutsis lived together for many years. While everyone knew their ethnic categories, they didn't form alliances. Only when certain forces prompted a cognitive shift, where most people started believing the prosperity of another group threatened their interests, did these alliances form. After that, all it took was a spark for tragedy to unfold. Listening to these analyses, you might feel pessimistic. 
but what comes next will make you optimistic about large-scale human cooperation. Yes, we're going to talk about trade and market economies. Starting from the perspective of the decomposing modules design stance, let's ponder on this, which modules did evolution provide us humans with to establish trading markets? Trade might seem straightforward, you have a basket of apples, I have a piece of cloth, both beneficial to each other, and we can exchange. But as always, the more natural an instinct seems, the more it's worth dissecting and studying. Our feeling that trade is straightforward precisely signifies a meticulous design behind it by evolution and natural selection. It allows trade to operate effortlessly on a subconscious level, without the need for conscious deliberation. In that example, the essence lies in why apples and cloth can be exchanged. Even chimpanzees engage in reciprocity, but it's usually the exchange of similar types of goods or services, like grooming each other, immediate exchanges. Or, for instance, I share some food with you, expecting you to reciprocate next time, delayed exchange, still involving the same kind of goods or service. Humans, however, can easily assess the relative value of different items. I have scissors, you have apples, the values don't match, but we can use different quantities to balance the utility of the exchange, say, trading one pair of scissors for 20 apples. Different item transactions are exceedingly rare among other species but represent the first trade psychology module humans possess, termed the utility assessment module. The second trade psychology module is the ownership judgment module. To trade, one must first establish what's mine and what's not. Evolution has provided humans with several related modules. For instance, in ownership, there are principles commonly agreed upon, first come, first served, if you toil for it, it's yours. Humans not only intuitively judge ownership but can articulate ownership clearly. All human languages have specific vocabulary concerning ownership, expressing phrases like, someone owns something. Moreover, all languages differentiate reasonable ownership, unreasonable occupation, or temporary usage rights. The third trade psychology module is dedicated to detecting deception and freeriding behavior. It's a given that some individuals aim to benefit more and pay less in trades. Under such evolutionary pressure, humans evolved a corresponding detection system. Essentially, we possess an automatic anti-fraud system. We tend to investigate the identity of those we're trading with, assessing their past transaction records, reputation, whether they are collaborators or deceivers, if they engage in fair voluntary exchanges, or enforce unfair trades on the disadvantaged. These details matter, and once we confirm a partner's trustworthiness, we are more inclined to engage in multiple transactions with this familiar ally. In summary, these three modules, utility assessment, ownership judgment, and detection of deception and free riding, collectively help us humans construct trade markets. These modules have led to the flourishing division of labor, market economies, and the rapid development of human productivity we witness today. However, it's important to note that because trade psychology evolved in prehistoric familiar exchanges, we're not psychologically adapted to large-scale transactions with strangers in modern times. For instance, people often intuitively dislike free markets, especially those focusing solely on the quality and price of goods, devoid of personal relationships. Why? It's because such one-time transactions with strangers trigger our detection of deception and free riding module, making us feel immediately exploited by someone with an unknown identity. Hence, many in business first establish relationships, aligning with human trade psychology. Most prefer repeated transactions based on mutual understanding and trust. So, why do people happily buy things in their favorite celebrities live stream? It's not just because of the relatively advantageous prices but, more importantly, the emotional connection formed between the celebrity and the fans, making consumers feel that their idol is a familiar person who wouldn't cause them losses in transactions. Here's another example. People often distrust profit-driven commercial organizations but trust non-profit ones that don't seek financial gain, even though, many times, commercial organizations are more efficient and better at meeting people's needs. Understanding this phenomenon is more accessible when seen from the detection of deception and freeriding module. One significant aspect while this module runs automatically is to detect the other party's intentions. If their intention is solely to gain profit, 
no matter how enticing their conditions might seem, it could be an attempt to defraud. But if their intent includes goodwill and a desire to assist, even if the immediate trade conditions aren't the best, in the long run, dealing with them might be the most beneficial. So, this more or less covers the gist of, Minds Make Societies. Finally, let me summarize the essence of this book for you. 1. Don't regard humans as a collective entity or describe human behavior based on beliefs and intentions. View humans as a complex system composed of many independently functioning modules, psychological organs, similar in essence to our eyes, nose, ears, and hands. 2. Each module has its activation cues and specific information it focuses on. If information doesn't match a module, it won't alter the conclusions drawn by that particular module. 3. We can't directly observe the indicator of evolutionary fitness. Therefore, our modules often monitor observable cues, termed, proxy indicators. For dot the conclusions drawn by modules aren't always correct or factual, but they are usually evolutionarily useful. 5.in human males, the module for, guarding spouses, ensuring they don't stray, and securing the survival of offspring, is more critical than the, seeking sexual opportunities, module. 6. That we possess an automatically running, alliance detection, module. Competing for resources between different alliances is the real origin of discrimination and hostility. Furthermore, we have the, utility assessment, ownership judgment, and, detection of deception and freeriding, modules, which collectively assist humans in building trade markets. That sums up the essence of, Minds Make Societies. Congratulations on finishing another book. Thank you all for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom with practice to achieve our financial goals and create a better future together. Thank you, goodbye.